I wanted to say how, how thrilled I am to, to be here because, first of all, I think it's a great idea for, for a conference. Um, what you're meeting about today is creativity, commerce, copyright, counterfeiting, and policy. And uh, in my family, I, I come from a family where my stepfather, who raised me, was a novelist and short story writer. My mother was a computer systems analyst and a, um, an economics major. <laughs> so um, this was a household where I was encouraged to be artistic, uh, not just encouraged, really almost pushed, pushed uh, towards it. Um, my stepfather felt that that was the only sane thing to be in, in this society was, was an artist. Um, my mother agreed with him, but also kind of hammered into all of us that we also had to make a living uh, and that we um, couldn't just be artists, that we had, to, we had to find our way in the world. I should also add that I, I grew up in, in New York City. Um, I grew up in East Harlem and on the Upper West Side. I was what you call a, a hot lunch kid, which uh, a hot lunch kid is one of those children who qualifies for hot lunch because you're below the poverty line. So in our family, uh, being an artist came with a real risk that if you did not earn a living, that uh, there was the risk of, of living in poverty for the rest of your life. So my mother's message to me, which was make your living, um, came with an extra added weight. Uh, it wasn't just, it wasn't like be an artist or, el and, or else you can fall back on your trust fund. <laughs> that was not an option in my family. So, um, so I, I grew up in this kind of environment. Um, I was thinking yesterday that this, uh, this invitation allows me to look back not only on the last 25 years of my career, but even before that, um, in the mid-70s when uh, you were in Nashville, I was at home I, in 1976. I was at home uh, in playing my guitar, playing my acoustic guitar in my bedroom. Um, at that moment in time, the acoustic guitar was already considered sort of a, uh, a tool that was not really cool. Um, punk rock was sort of on the ascent, and a lot of people, uh, as he pointed out, were not a lot of people were not very encouraging about a girl with an acoustic guitar. A lot of people felt that was very, I was a bit of a throwback to some previous era. Um, I didn't really see it that way. Um, I think that the acoustic guitar, like, a, like the MP3 or like a knife, is a tool, and you can use it in many different ways. You can, you can be destructive with it or you can be positive with it. Um, so uh, there are moments in time when I, when I look moments when I look back on that moment in time and I think how far I've come from being that girl with the acoustic guitar. And a, a lot of that has beca ha is because of how I've embraced technology over the years and how I've been confronted with certain copyright issues uh, and what I did with them. So I'll tell you about those in, in story form. So in 1976, I remember walking into the kitchen and um, trying to see if dinner was on the stove and my mother um, proudly telling me that she was online with uh, the Hunter College Library and she felt this was, was a really exciting thing. She showed me this computer that she had in the kitchen. It was about the size of a small refrigerator and she had the telephone hooked up to this computer, um, which I guess was through a modem. Uh, I was 16 years old and really more interested in a snack or a meal. <laughs> um, but she was excited by this, and uh, you know, she showed this to me, and she thought it was really cool, and I thought it was cool too, in a sort of, you know, um, hungry sort of way. Um, uh, but that image of the computer in our kitchen has has never left me, and especially since in 1976, it was kind of unusual to have a a woman who was a computer systems analyst. Um, in, in any household. Um, so I've watched with amazement while the um, computers have gotten smaller and smaller and more and more elegant and more and more part of our lives. Um, 
At the same time, my father was teaching me how to copyright my songs. I had probably 100 songs by the time I was 16 years old. The way that I copyrighted wrote them back then was to print them out on a piece of paper, make a cassette tape of them, put them in a little box, wrap the whole thing up in brown paper, um, wrap it with string so no one could get in, I guess, and then you would take this little it looked like a little art piece um, to the post office and they would stamp it all over with the date and that proved that you had these songs on this date and as long as that seal wasn't broken your um, stuff was copywritten. So I had about five of these boxes by the time I was 21 or 22 and my father made sure that um, that, that was one of the very first things I learned right after I learned how to write a song was how to copyright it. So this was part of the atmosphere that I grew up in. Um, So in some ways, I've, as I said, I've, I feel rather qualified for the issues and uh, that have confronted me since then. Um, in the early 80s, I wrote a song called Tom's Diner. Um, it was a song that I had imagined um, with a piano accompaniment. I did not play piano. Um, I decided rather than hiring someone to play piano that I would just start to sing it a cappella. And this worked better than I ever could have imagined. Um, I started to use it to open my shows because it always got people's attention. And I played in loud, noisy bars. Uh, so I realized that if I started to sing this song, which is about drinking coffee and feeling alienated at breakfast at a diner, um, that if I sang it simply and in front of people, uh, that they would stop drinking, stop talking, and turn around and watch the show. So I used it to open my shows. Um, five years later, uh, it came time to record the song, and I decided to, to keep it simple and a cappella in that way, not record it with, a, um, with any instrumentation, and that became a kind of defining moment for me. Um, in 1987, that song, Tom's Diner, um, was the opening track to that album, and that album sold three million copies, so it was a song that was fairly well known but very simply recorded. It was just my voice. So, unbeknownst to me, there was a uh, an engineer named Karl Heinz Brandenburg uh, who was working for the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, he was working. He was in his laboratory working on something called an MP3. Um, the MP3, as you know, recreates um, the human voice. It rec recreates everything. Whether or not it recreates it perfectly um, is open to debate. They'll tell you that it recreates sound perfectly. M most of us don't think so. Most of, it, uh, most of us feel that there's some compression that happens and you lose a bit of the sonic quality. But you cannot tell that to Karl Heinz Brandenburg <laughs> because he will argue with you. His whole team will argue with you that it's, it's a perfect, faithful reproduction. Um, so they had this thing that they were working on called the MP3, and they felt that if uh, they felt that they had finished it, and they thought, um, and somewhere down a hallway, um, Karl Heinz Brandenburg ho heard my voice singing Tom's Diner, and he thought, if if this is really finished, we'll run this human voice through the MP3, and it will recreate it perfectly. So he got a copy of Solitude Standing, ran it through, and it sounded monstrous. And I've actually heard the distortions that happened when they first ran my voice through the MP3. It, it really sounded monstrous. It sounded like some kind of exorcist version of Tom's Diner. <laughs> Um, so they, apparently they worked on it for months and months, and they ran my voice and other things through the MP3, and eventually when it recreated it perfectly, they felt that they had finally finished it. So all of this was reported in a, um, a magazine article called uh, Business Week, I think, and this came out in the year 2000. Um, someone said, so therefore any MP3 that is played anywhere is a result of Karl Heinz Brandenburg's ears and Suzanne Vega's voice and that apparently makes me the mother of the MP3. <laughs> so I've uh, been often asked how I feel about my children, uh, <laughs> which some of them are very wayward and some of them are not. You know, I mean, as I said before, an MP3 is sort of a neutral thing. You can use it, you can use it to for your for empowerment, or you can use it to destroy an entire industry. Um, it's kind of in, it in and of itself is not an 
and it's, it's, it's not evil in and of itself. It's a bit like a knife, you know, it's how you use it. Um, the other uh, interesting thing about Tom's Diner that happened around that same time, around 1990, was that because of the simplicity of the recording, um, <laughs> I was act I had, we had all sort of moved on in life. I had come out with my third album. I was in the middle of um, trying to promote my third album, which was called Days of Open Hand, and I suddenly got a panicked uh, message from my manager who said that these two boys in England had taken Tom's Diner and had infringed the copyright law, and they had um, put this, this uh, I forgot what, what type of music it was called back then. It wasn't called hip-hop. It was called house music or something. So they had taken a rhythm track and, and added it to my voice and made this chorus out of the, the ending, and, and they were furious. Um, this is a and m legal department was furious. They were going to take these boys, throw them in jail. Um, there was a lot of fuss and, and hopping up and down. So uh, my manager at the time, Ron Fierstein, played me the song. Um, I really liked it. I, thought, I felt that the copyright actually was not completely infringed. The song itself, the narrative of the song was the same. My voice was the same. It's just the production was wildly different um, than the w simple one that I had on my own album. So at the time, I said, rather than going the usual route, which would be to try and shut down the whole thing, um, the, the DNA boys had said that they, that they loved their version. They said they had tried to contact A&M to get uh, permission. They said no one called them back. So they felt what they had was really good, and they started to print them up themselves and sell them on, on the corner of their local shop, which was in Bath. So back then it was still vinyl um, that they were selling, huge vinyl um, in, in a white envelope. And it began selling immediately. So, of course, then they got the call back from A&M saying, you have to stop this. Um, so they're, they're, they said they tried to get the, the uh, permission first. Well, I heard it, and I said, well, I like it, and why can't we just release it uh, ourselves? Let's buy it from them, um, which we did for a flat fee, and then I ended up retaining the rights to the remix, which we released, and instead of just being a small club remix, ended up going top ten all over the world and selling millions of copies of that single, um, and then spawned all other kinds of remixes, interpolations, this, we're probably up to 50 now, I guess, 20 years later. Um, it seems to be a, something of a rite of passage to take Tom's Diner and remix it. Um, everybody from Tupac, uh, before he died, did a version of it. Um, Danger Mouse, um, Destiny's Child. Uh, the most recent one is Drake, who apparently has not released it officially, so therefore does not pay me anything <laughs> on it because he's not selling it. Um, so um, so this, is, this issue of copyright, in, is it infringement or is it enhancement, is one that I still um, wrestle with today. Um, I, I, because of where I came from, I am likely to look at someone and say, um, well, first of all, I, is this artist going to make money on my remix? And if so, then I'll ask for a royalty of some kind. But if it's someone who's not going to make a lot of money or not selling it for profit, as Danger Mouse did not sell it for profit, he did a, a remix of, of Tom's Diner with um, 50 Cent. Um, so, so these are issues that I face all the time now. It's a very contemporary problem to have, even though it's kind of been going on for, for 20 years. Um, that one small song really kind of exponentially changed my entire career um, and has given me all kinds of options that I would not have had. But um, so, but I still believe that you still have to have a copyright law. You still have to be able to protect the boundaries. There have been times where I've said, no, you cannot use Tom's Diner for, for example, pornography. That's probably been one of the only times I've said no. I'm like, well, I don't understand why you would want to use that song for pornography. I don't think it would be very effective. <laughs> well, you see what I mean when I sing it later. Um, so uh, anyway, I think it's the artist's right to, to say no if you want to. But why not say yes if you can? Um, but you need the copyright law there for that. Um, 
one thing that, that I think is interesting is um, I do a lot of work with children because of where I come from. So I've done uh, a couple of programs. One is called um, Principal for a Day. So you go to a school and you, you talk to children and about what they want to do or be in life. Um, another program is called the Grammys in the Schools. And I've done that for the Naris group. And it's very interesting to get a child's perspective on the music industry these days. Uh, one girl stood up and proudly said that she um, downloads songs for free because for her, 99 cents is a meal. And she would rather have a meal than a song, especially if she can get the song for free. Um, and, and her friends applauded her. And so I think that, and I, I was moved by this because I remembered myself where I came from and I, I know her perspective, I know what she's talking about. Uh, my own daughter who's 16 years old, she says she's the only one in her grade who pays for, um, for downloads. And I know, I know that she does pay for downloads because she has access to my iTunes account and to my credit card um, indirectly. <laughs> So it's not every child that has that um, that has that access to their parents' credit card to to buy the money uh, to buy the songs with their parents' money. Um, what I'm wondering and hoping is that in the future, as these children mature and start to create their own art and start to realize that it's not just about the exposure, because uh, a lot of my daughter is a vocal major at LaGuardia, a lot of the children that she goes to class with start to feel that it's it's not so much the selling of it it's um that exposure is the thing you know and it, and that if you can um and i i don't obviously i don't all agree completely with it if you you can have all the exposure in the world but if there's you don't have something that you can sell that you can make money from you know 10 percent or 50 percent of nothing is still nothing um, so what I'm hoping is that as the generation matures and makes their art and realizes that they have to make a living also, that um, that there'll be a, a sea change that will happen, that um, that uh, that the social climate will change. Just the way, say, 30 years ago, child abuse was practiced at home, but you weren't allowed to speak about it in public. You weren't, um, that's not so much the case anymore because laws have changed, um, or especially with domestic violence. Um, so I, I've seen a change in that world in my lifetime, so I'm hoping that there will be a similar kind of change in, uh, in, in, in this world, that taking someone's work and copying it and recreating it and, and for your own use is will eventually be seen as, as not so cool. That's what I would like to see. Um, so in a few minutes, I'll open up this little chat to questions and answers. And hopefully, you'll have some questions for me, which I can answer. <laughs> um, so over the years, I feel that uh, that I've managed to thrive. Uh, that I've uh, that I've been a, a girl with an acoustic guitar. That because I've married the acoustic guitar with whatever the technology of the day is, whether it's synthesizers back in 1984, or whether it's Facebook or um, you know the the technologies of t of today, whether it's GarageBand, um, that I've not just thrived, not just survived, but but managed to thrive. Um, one of the ways I've done that recently is that I've re-recorded all of my older material on my own record label, which I've called Amanuensis Productions. So I don't own my original recordings, the ones that were big hits back in the 80s and 90s. I don't own those recordings, but I do own my songs. So I've put out my um, songs again on on my own label, and I sell them at my own shows, and I sell them on my website. So this gives me hands-on access to to the fans, which um, I didn't have before. And one thing I found that's remar that's hugely successful is if I sell the CDs at the shows and meet the fans afterwards, and will sign something for them, meet them face to face. That is something that they can't get on iTunes, something that can't be downloaded for free somewhere else, and they are willing to pay. Twelve to fifteen dollars for a CD, especially if I sign it for them, and that's been hugely successful. And it gives me something to sell for the rest of my touring life, which hopefully will be 
at least for the next 20 years or so. So that's one way in which technology is, is our friend and is, um, um, is working for me at this moment in time. Um, so this is my story, and uh, this is what I'm hoping. I'm thrilled, actually, that you're having this conference today, and I wish you the best of luck with it, and I hope that you can... Uh, can parlay this into the future in a, in a very positive way. Do you have any, any questions? Well, I don't get uh, the call. <laughs> uh, he wants to know how does it feel if I get the call from my record label um, saying that that there, there's where people are pirating the material. Um, first of all, I, I have my own record label now, and I know that people are pirating the material, but I don't. Um, what I what I'm trying to do at this moment in time is focus on what I can do instead of trying to figure out how to shut down the 92% of the people who are downloading illegally. I'm concentrating more on what I can do to to provide a service that can't be duplicated in that way. So, I mean, how do I feel? I feel I feel that we should do something about it, but uh, do you, what can we do exactly? I'm not sure. That's why I think that these kinds of um, conferences are a great idea. Because we need to, um, to, to find the way around it. Yeah. Hello. Anyway, um, so I hear people um, on the other side of this debate. Yeah, I'm sure you do. The, so do I. Yeah. Right, say that the, the, the music industry is as healthy as ever in the sense that uh, new music's being created. There's lots of creativity. Yeah. Uh, people are able to get to the music that they want, even if the record companies aren't as profitable. Sure. And and my question would be for you as an artist. Yeah. To say how do you feel about the state of creativity and music uh, in light of you know, the, the economic changes that have occurred as a result of piracy. Um, what's the second half of your question? Well, as, as in light of the, the changing economics. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what, how do you feel that's affecting uh, creativity and music? Well, creativity is one thing, and where the money comes from is another thing. I mean, I think there's no question that the economy, uh, that the music industry in the 80s and 90s was this huge bloated machine, which, um, yes, in some ways I benefited from. Uh, but it was wildly out of proportion to, say, other arts, for example. I have friends who are choreographers. They don't make nearly the amount of money. Um, so uh, I think in some ways there needed to be a correction. But the, um, I think, yes, music is thriving. I think music will always thrive. I think uh, and it, because people need to make it and people need to hear it. Um, and in some ways, uh, having my own record label means that uh, I can use the new technology to have more of a hands-on connection, and I can also make more of a percentage uh, from my own recordings than I did when I was with A&M Records or Blue Note. Um, so it's not a question. One, I don't know that one affects the other so much. I think people will make music if they want to make music. I do think that, yes, music itself is thriving. Um, I don't know that one has to do with the other. I'm not saying the old system was so great either because as I said, no one, I don't own my own material. I got maybe 12% of what the profits were um, back then. I get more of them now. Um, but it's, um, I don't agree that the exposure is the important thing. You know, I think you need a way to make money. Um, and some of these younger bands are figuring out how to do it, but it, it's through Facebook and through MySpace and places like that. That's how the technology is helpful. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here today. Building on what you just said about uh, you know young people and exposure and all that, I was struck by oh thank you. I was struck by your mention of your 16-year-old daughter who's studying voice, yeah. and um, I'm curious what you would say to her or to other creatives, frankly, in any field who are looking to not just be creative, but to hopefully you know, make a living or, or carve out a life for themselves with their art. 
what do I say to her? Well, it's really what she says to me. <laughs> um, I mean, she uh, she has the capability of, of writing songs and producing them herself. She's really good on, on GarageBand. And she, because I asked her recently, do you want to be a songwriter? Do you want to be a performer? And she said, oh, so I can... I can produce, I can write and produce my own songs and then release them for free on Facebook and, and, and get nothing back for all of my hard work. I mean, she basically said it back to me in a nutshell, so she's aware of the situation. Um, I think she'll find her way because she's, her own particular interest is classical music and th musical theater. Um, and the musical theater um, situation, I mean, that's a, a live event that you can't recreate. You can buy the cast recordings and all of that, but it's really all about the performance. And she knows that, and so she, that's those are her her particular areas of interest. She's not really that interested in in pop music because she's seen she's seen it firsthand. She knows what the tour buses are like. She knows what the clubs are like. She's not watching American Idol, thinking, "Oh, that's the life for me." Um, so she's seen the backstage part of it. Um, so uh, I think what I would tell her is that you you have to find your way, you know, and hopefully she'll she's learned already how to be useful in different situations, how to read music, how to be hired as a say a, a musical director for a theater production or something like that. So that's her particular thing. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. Firstly, how do you see audience? changing over your life uh, over your creative life has the audience dramatically changed now in terms of your relationship with that audience and secondly wh why why do you think there's such hostility particularly in the internet on the internet to artists like yourself who stand up for the creative rights of artists um, my audience has changed not so much in the demographic. I, I always had a wide mixture of people who liked my material, whether they were young people who liked the fantasy element or whether they're teenagers who like the poetry or whether they're older people who like the craftsmanship. Um, I had that back then and I still have that now. Obviously, it's a lot smaller. Um, the audience that I play to these days is, is a smaller group, but it's still more or less the same demographic. Uh, do you find the audience more assertive, more demanding of their own kind of rights? Not when I'm performing. I mean, when I'm singing. I, you mean, do they demand certain songs um, on a one-to-one -one basis if I'm standing and performing? Uh, no. I mean, they let me know what they think about on Facebook. Um, and if, I, if they get too demanding and too assertive, you just press the delete button or the block <laughs> situation, and they're gone forever. So that's fine, too. Um, but, and your second question was? Uh, about, um, th there are groups on the internet yes, right. and in okay, politics yeah. who are. No, no, I've been part of those panels where I'm the only one um, representing artists' rights. So and it's the intolerance of yeah. the other side to your opinions that I'm interested in. Why are these people so hostile? Um, I think it's a generational thing. I think they feel that it's, in some ways it's a response to the bloatedness and the corporate mentality of the, the 80s and the 90s. Um, it's sort of a, a younger generation's way of saying those are not our values. Our values are more spiritual. We feel that music wants to be free. I've heard that argument. Um, but in some ways I think there's a utopian part of that vision. If you take it to its logical extreme, why aren't we giving food away? I mean, maybe oranges want to be free, too. I mean, how are we supposed to know? So that seems a bit, you know, ingenious to me when I hear. And I, I've been on a few of the panels, I sa as I said. And coming from where I come from, I cannot buy into that. I'm uh, Coming from East Harlem and knowing what things cost and what thing, what you need to survive, I can't, I can't, um, I can't, be part of that that team. I, I've been a single mother. You know, I feel like um, I know oranges are not free. I know what they cost, and I've put my work out there, and I think that it should be protected. And that's my point of view. So, but um, what I'm hoping is that over time, that that the atmosphere will soften. Otherwise, maybe I'll just go back and become a receptionist, as I had been in the early '80s before I became a songwriter. 
Um, <clears throat> iTunes kind of has proven that you can hit a price point where people will at least do the right or attempt to do the right thing. Yeah. And I think that that that's a real key element in in looking to the future. Um, yeah. I, from an RS point of view, I, I guess you're also looking at a situation where if the record company picks the wrong person to go after. They kind of create a martyr out there for everybody who says, oh, music should be free. That person's being pounded on. Yeah. So it's very critical to make the right case at the right time with the right person. And I th I'm do sure it is. Because do you, do you feel as an artist that you would get blowback from that, and all artists would get blowback from that if they pick the wrong case to kind of make their point with? And, and, and Probably, one other thing, yes. and, and, and mean, do you think do you think that the record companies have sort of like seen the light, and they're not going? They understand the iTunes model from from the profit point of view, or are they still kind of clinging to? Gee, can we keep the price real expensive? You know, I have not spoken to any major labels recently, and uh, I'm not really part of. I was part of A&M Records for 18 years and part of Blue Note for two years, but I really am my own little entity these days. So I cannot even imagine what the mentality is or what they're thinking or what they're pretending or or any of that. I can't really um, comment on that. But um, I do think, yes, if you choose someone and you litigate with them, you'll make a martyr out of them. And I think that's that's the way things are right now. I think in 10 years or in 20 years, that might change. It, I'm not sure which direction it's going to change in. I would like to think that people, as they mature, would see that they would, would feel from their hearts that there's something not right with that argument, um, that you can't just take stuff for, for free because it's available. Um, you know, I'm also reading uh, um, Epictetus right now, so I'm sort of <laughs> uh, in that mentality of like the the philosophical mind that we all want to do the right thing. Um, maybe I'm maybe I should read some other <laughs> some some other philosopher, and he might be a little more um, contemporary. So um, I hope I've I've answered your question to some degree. I'd like to take one more question, and then I'll sing a couple of songs, and then we'll close. On my left, yeah. Um, a lot of my friends look at music now with it being so easy to acquire for free yeah. um, in a completion aspect uh, or a collection, and they do it to collect volume instead of valuing the purchases. Do you have any ideas on how we can get young people to start valuing their purchases and valuing the art as something that they they own and you know, value and um, put meaning behind instead of just acquiring it and storing it on their hard drive? That's an interesting question. I know exactly what you mean. Um, I asked my niece once. She said, told me she was a big Dar Williams fan. And I said, really, what, what CDs do you have? And she just looked at me like, I don't have any CDs. You know, she has a playlist that, of things that she's acquired and no, she didn't pay for them and she doesn't really care about the CDs. Um, how... I don't know. I, to, to me, that's that I can't. Uh, I don't identify with that. I love my CDs. If if I love an artist, if I care about them, I buy the actual physical thing because I want the physical thing. Plus, when I go see them, then I have something that they can sign. Um, so it, that's meaningful to me. It's like an artifact. It's like it's like a thing. Um, maybe but the younger generation will will learn to value it, or maybe they just want like as much stuff as possible right now. I, I'm not sure how to, I, I think it's a generational thing. I don't know how to make them love the, the, the physical um, manifestation of the song, you know. Um, it's something that you, you learn for yourself. I mean, there's some artists that just, uh, like Bob Dylan, it's like, you want the CD, and end of story. Um, so this is something every generation, I guess, has to learn for themselves, or, or not. Maybe they'll, as I said, it's a it's a value system at work there too. They feel that they don't want the thing. The thing doesn't mean anything. Things are overly valued in this society. So maybe it's just trying to find its own level. But thanks for raising the question. It's really it's an interesting one. It's a valid one. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to sing a couple of things now <laughs> to conclude. Um,
Actually, I think I'll just I'll sing the one song. I'll sing Tom's Diner. You already know what it's about. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee. He fills it only halfway, and before I even argue, he is looking out the window at somebody coming in. It is always nice to see you, says the man behind the counter to the woman who has come in. She is shaking her umbrella, and I look the other way as they are kissing their hellos, and I'm pretending not to see them, and instead I pour the milk. I open up the paper, there's a story of an actor who had died while he was drinking. It was no one I had heard of, and I'm turning to the horoscope and looking for the funnies when I'm feeling someone watching me, and so I raise my head. There's a woman on the outside looking inside. Does she see me? No, she does not really see me, cause she sees her own reflection, and I'm trying not to notice that she's hitching up her skirt and while she's straightening her stockings her hair has gotten wet oh this rain it will continue through the morning as i'm listening to the bells of the cathedral i am thinking of your voice and of the midnight picnic once upon a time before the rain began. And I finish up my coffee and it's time to catch the train. Thank you so much for having me.